Gamers have an obsession with perfection. From platinum trophy achievement collectors to speedrunners chasing world records to challenge runners beating games despite insane restrictions, players are constantly finding new ways to chase that perfect game. This is also a perfect game. Wow. Fighting game developers understand this desire for perfection. Sure, a win with one pixel of health remaining counts just as much as a flawless victory, but we all know it doesn't feel the same. Unique perfect screens and win animations are ways of rewarding the player for going above and beyond, and they give the player another reason to chase that perfection. So, what about Smash? Oh, poor Pikachu. Just don't DI, dude. Don't DI this. Thank you. <laughs> My first ever live JV5 I've ever seen. Man, that's kind of lame. Well, there's a few reasons why Smash doesn't have perfect KO screens. The game isn't always 1v1. The game has modes where KOs don't even matter. Nintendo also probably wanted to keep a more chill vibe than, say, Mortal Kombat, where the developers were much happier to rub defeat in the loser's face or ribcage. Peace unlocked. But also, the Smash Perfect is far, far less likely. A round in a fighting game is probably more equivalent to a stock in a Smash game, and even in first to two round games like Street Fighter, double perfects are pretty rare. In Melee, you have to get through the equivalent of four perfect rounds, and even then, Smash has yet more obstacles in front of you. Foremost among them, instead of starting from neutral after a round win, the player losing a stock comes back with invincibility, a comeback mechanic designed to make the perfect game that much less likely. Oh, and then there's this guy. Okay, okay, we get it, stop, stop. But despite all of these obstacles, that magic does happen every now and again. The stars align, a few things go incredibly right, and a player is particularly on point for one glorious minute. Just because the game doesn't act like something special has happened doesn't mean we as a group of obsessive nerds don't take notice. Oh, yeah, that was one right there. Nice. Now, you might be tempted to think that JV stands for something. No, it's not Junior Varsity, but instead, this is an old bit of Smash history that goes back to the game's first decade. A Melee player by the name of JV3X3 was infamous for refusing to consider his stock taken until you dealt damage to the next one. If he was at two stocks and 0% when he won the game, he insisted that he had three stocked you. To a normal person, this was a two stock, but to JV, it was a three stock. And so, the JVX terminology was born, and Melee's Perfect, a clean, undamaged four stock, got its name, the JV5. Today, we're going to take a dive deep into the absurdity of Smash JVs, the statistics behind why they're so unlikely, and the psychology surrounding them. Buckle up, and remember, don't get hit. Paid actor? You guys have no idea how hard that was. Speaking of paid actors, do you know about Raid Shadow Legends? God damn it, yeah, we're doing it. Raid Shadow Legends. <sighs> okay, here we go. Raid Shadow Legends is a hit mobile hero collection RPG played by over 80 million people from around the world. Get ready to raid. Please, stop. Okay, but there are a few misconceptions about this game that I want to address. The first is that Raid has no depth, which isn't exactly true. The Cursed City is one of Raid's biggest campaigns since the Doom Tower. It has over 100 stages to complete, including challenges where you have to fight multiple bosses at the same time. As you work your way through the Cursed City and complete its various quests, you may even get your hands on a mythical champion. A couple other misconceptions are that it takes too much time and it's too pay to win, which that's not really true either. You can play Raid on an auto-battler mode, which is a great time save if you want to multitask while grinding the game, and it's cross-platform, so you can play it basically anywhere. As for pay to win, well, yeah, your rich friends are going to progress much faster than you, but there are plenty of people who for some reason play this game without spending any money, and they're apparently having fun too. With over 800 unique champions to collect from different factions, billions of ways to customize and build them, and tons of challenging bosses to take on, there really is an endless amount of content. Anyway, if you're interested, you can support the channel by using my QR code in the top left of of your screen or the links down below to download Raid for yourself, and you'll get some really crazy bonus gifts if you do. I'm talking 500k silver, energy, and chicken, and the epic champion Juliana after reaching level 15. Come find me in-game under the name Turndown for Walt, it's the number 4 because there was a character limit, but I guess phonetically it's still fine. Or join my clan Turndown for Walt, spelled correctly, goddammit, and join in on the action. Thank you again to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring today's video. Go download the game today and you'll help support me and this channel at the same time. Okay, time to transition now. All right, so every Smash title has its own JV. There was the JV3 for Smash 4's two stock meta, that sucked, and the JV4 for the three stock metas of Brawl and Ultimate. 
In modern times, Smash 64 also shares the JV5 with Melee, but there was a time when there was a 5-stock meta, and therefore the JV6 was possible. As ridiculous as it sounds, Smash 64 is the most touch of death game in the series, so it absolutely was possible. And if you're familiar with the name Gerson, it's probably because he was the one getting camped out in the longest game of Smash history. But Gerson was on the good side of this piece of history, recording what was claimed to be the first ever JV6 in a 5-stock N64 Smash game. And yes, we have to specify this because Isaiah got a JV6 once, but in a 6-stock game. For Melee, we did some digging ourselves, but I also did what all great researchers do. I asked my Twitter followers for help. So let's go back to the oldest one they were able to unearth. This one takes us back 13 years. This was peak PPMD, one of the five gods of Melee, against a poor Captain Falcon main by the tag of Tubes. It's hard to say much about Tubes' gameplay here, and that's not even meant to be dismissive. It's just because PPMD simply did not let the Falcon breathe. The first stock needed just one clean opening, and the second took only two. The third stock was Tubes' best chance of breaking free. It took PP all of three openings to seal this one, and then the fourth stock. PP dropped a couple of early kill opportunities, but every time he was right back on the Falcon, making it impossible to even return to neutral. While we could sit here and debate how many openings this one was, for the rest of the video, for consistency's sake, we're going to rely on Slippy's definition of an opening. And by this definition, that last stock is just one opening. Tube certainly never escaped disadvantage for 45 actionable frames. PP's punish game was so strong that he was able to find new extensions even after awkward reverse hits or after allowing Tubes to get to the ledge. But back to the matter at hand, no matter what level you're at, this is probably what a JV5 is likely to look like. It usually isn't four clean zero to deaths right in a row. Instead, it's a couple of early edge guards combined with a couple of stocks with clean neutral and a couple of big punish extensions. At the end of it all, this game is finished within a single digit number of actual openings, seven in the case of PP vs Tubes. Here's an example Marth player ePoodle provided from a netplay tournament in early 2021. ePoodle gets there in his own way, but this once again looks like seven openings to take the JV5. Four to clear the first stock, then one at a time as the Ganon player slowly loses his grip on both reality and the stage. This example doesn't come from a tournament set, but Leffen had one of the only JV5s we were able to find with slippy stats attached to it. No counting necessary on this one. Six openings was all it took, and given the way Leffen was flexing his 1.5 openings per stock in this game, we can safely assume that's ridiculous, even by his lofty punish standards. Now, this is getting us somewhere. We can say now that two things have to be true for a JV5 to even be possible. One, you have to be capable of winning at least six neutral breaks in a row, and two, you have to be capable of a punish game that can end four stocks in such a low number of neutral breaks. You're probably wondering what the hell a neutral break even is, so let me quickly explain in an infomercial styled format so we can get you back into the meat of this video as quick as you can say, gallant stands for grounded, actionable ledge intangibility, or whatever. Neutral, to keep things as simple as possible, is that time where both players are trying to hit each other and or not get hit. The start of a neutral break? Well, that's easy. It's when somebody gets hit with pretty much anything that isn't a fox laser. They're put into hit stun, and that opens up the opportunity for the opponent to come at them and hit them even more. The harder part is deciding where a neutral break ends and neutral begins once again. Advantage isn't just about true combos. Tech chasing, juggling, edge guarding, and ledge trapping are all ways of extending a neutral break, even though the defender can still take actions during these kinds of plays. Thankfully, we can use that slippy definition for an opening pretty interchangeably with neutral breaks, so, uh, yeah, that's it. Alright, back to it. The difficulty of that second point can vary significantly depending on the context. Even if the opponent is competent, some characters have really simple edge guards in some matchups, and the one or two opening KO can be trivial. But even if point two is satisfied, point one is a problem for even the greatest of players. To have even a 50% chance of winning 10 straight openings, you'd need to have somewhere between a 90 and 95% chance of winning each individual neutral break. Maybe your punish game gets you into that PP Leffen range where you can do it in 6 or 7 neutral wins, but even then, a 90% neutral win rate doesn't get you to even odds of winning 7 neutral breaks in a row. And even if you're the next Leffen and you can do it in just 6, you'd still need to be winning neutral at a closer to 90% rate than 85% to reach that break even point. But it's still extremely rare at any stage of bracket, to the point where Axe, one of the all-time greats and literally the best Pikachu player in the world, has said he's never gotten one, ever. Axe has played in so many tournaments and ran over so many round one opponents that it seems impossible that it hasn't happened at least once. There are two pretty simple explanations for this though. The first is that high-level melee players aren't playing with the goal of flawless victories. 
The second, though, is that high-level players don't just win games because they win neutral more often. If any set in Summit history was likely to produce a JV5, it was probably Zayn vs. Yingling, the first set of Day 1 of Smash Summit 11. This is perhaps a little unfair to Yingling, though. He is, by any normal person's definition, a really good melee player. He's been ranked in the strong Arizona scene, the same scene that produced Axe, multiple times, and according to PG Stats, he has a 63% win rate in tournament matches. That's a very solid player, one who would beat most of the people who called his Summit campaign unique. No more Yingling! But he also, of course, had no shot at beating Zane, then the world's number one player. Zane 3 would him and lost just four stocks across three games. Surely, he must have had an insanely high neutral win rate in this set, right? Well, we do have the slippy stats, so let's take a look. Huh. Okay, so nine of those neutral wins were lasers, but one, that's one of the reasons why JV5s are so hard if you're counting lasers, and two, Yingling still won 10 out of 33 neutral breaks not counting lasers, a 30% neutral win rate. The difference between these players is seen more in their ability to turn these openings into stocks. Yingling's other sets from that summit were more of the same. Against none, he actually won neutral more often. It was a little rougher against Amsa, but still, Amsa barely won over 60% of neutral breaks. How about Kadoran, his gauntlet stage opponent? 50-50, laser heavy sure, but still, one more match to look at, his losers match against SFAT. Whoa, okay, this right here is a perfect illustration of just why the JV5 is so rare. Even among two unevenly matched opponents, neutral win rates rarely go over 60%, and it's entirely possible for great players to win games without even winning the majority of neutral breaks. It's not too hard to understand why. Just ask yourself, if you're S-fat and your opponent needs 18 openings to kill you, do you really care about getting hit once? Okay, back to the chart. The line we should actually be looking at here is the 60% line. Even winning 6 neutral breaks at a 60% win rate has an under 5% chance of a JV5 coming to pass. If Yingling Summit sets are any indication, we can't expect top players to do much better in most of their bracket sets. It's no wonder the JV5 is so rare. But here's the thing. We've been talking about this as if every opening and every stock exists independently of each other. Anybody who has been on either side of a near JV5 or even been in the crowd for one knows that is absolutely not the case. The momentum starts building and you can almost physically feel something shift. Momentum has historically been a bit of a tough one for sports statisticians to nail down. As much as we might feel in our bones that it matters, many studies have shown that competitive momentum simply isn't a good predictor of future success, even within the same game. The most infamous study in this vein came from cognitive psychologist Amos Tversky, who designed a study to show that basketball's hot hand was indeed a fallacy. I'm simplifying it a bit, but it more or less goes like this. Tversky had a bunch of basketball players shoot free throws and then looked at if players shot better after making consecutive shots in a row. They didn't. Tversky found no correlation whatsoever. You were better off simply using the player's established free throw percentage if you wanted to make a solid prediction. Therefore, the hot hand doesn't exist, Tversky claimed, and many left it at that. Nearly 30 years after Tversky's paper was released, a trio of Harvard grad students, Andrew Boskowski, John Eskowitz, and Carolyn Stein, published a paper that finally challenged this idea. The hot hand does exist, this paper suggested, and Tversky and analysts who followed in his wake weren't asking the right questions. Ah, oh, right, we should probably get back to Melee. Here's Amsa playing on his stream. Enjoy this while I finish that basketball point real quick. So, this new study basically said you also need to look at how player behavior changes in response to somebody getting hot, both from the hot shooter and the players on defense. The authors found a few things. Players who get hot usually draw more attention from defenders, but get the confidence to keep taking more difficult shots anyway. And while their shooting percentages may not look much better after they get hot, when you adjust for the difficulty of the shots they take, the authors actually did find a statistically significant increase in shooting success. The hot hand does exist, and behavior changes around it. Oh hey, look at that. Oms is really close to a JV5. Think this fox's behavior might change a little bit here? And here come the pretzels. It wasn't just the fox frantically spamming lasers, though. Amsa's focus also tightened when he saw that the impossible was possible here. The allure of the JV5 is part of what even makes it doable in the first place. Amsa specifically started playing not to get hit even by the most negligible of attacks despite his lead, and he pushed his punish extensions as far as they would go. Unquestionably, momentum exists and affects player behavior in Smash in similar ways that it does in basketball. We've seen it in other Smash games as well. This time it's Ultimate at Riptide 2022. Top American Falco player Tilde, one of the tournament's favorites, has just dropped game one to a hometown hero. 
The opponent is Michigan Rob Main Lucy, a player who has made his name as part of one of the best doubles teams to ever do it across Smash 4 and Ultimate with his twin brother Linus. They're one of the craziest stories in Ultimate, two players who have never made an official ranking who nevertheless have destroyed teams of some of the best players in the world. The Smash games that make up the Brawl Extended Universe play with fewer stocks than Melee, two in the case of Smash 4, three for both Brawl and Ultimate. But the JV4 in Ultimate's case is still extremely difficult to achieve. Thanks to the intensely strong recoveries in Ultimate, it's very hard to take even three stocks in six or seven openings, which has looked like the magic number for Melee. And then there's Lucy's character, Rob. Much like Fox's lasers feel like they should make a JV5 practically impossible, Rob's projectile combo of an intangible, angleable, full-screen laser and a constantly active gyro should similarly prevent a JV4 against the robot. We don't have Slippy to help out here, but by our count, Tilde needed 8 openings to take the 3 stocks. That's pretty close to the number of times he taunted, just gaining more momentum as the game went on. Tilde would go on to win the set 2-1 behind a clean 2-stock in Game 3, and then he'd go on to win the whole tournament. After that up tilt, but the down there sends the spike, and Tilde, your Riptide 2022 Ultimate Singles Champion. The point here is, momentum definitely exists, but it's hard, if not impossible, to know what's going to kick it into gear. Some players, like Tilde, live to rub a win in the crowd's face. Others, like Amsa, get excited at the opportunity to turn on the gas and achieve perfection in a matchup where most assume it would be impossible. Alright, let's go back in time again. Sheik Legend Kirby Kaze is destroying another helpless early round opponent. Wait, what? This isn't round one pools at all. It's Kalamazoo, one of the best peaches to ever do it. A top 70 player of all time according to the Brain Trust at Melee Stats. A JV5 against a player of this level? How unimaginable would that be? Well, let's just listen to the commentary. All right, here we go. Oh my god. What if god. he doesn't. If this is no, this can't be. Oh, no way. Oh my god. Get this out. Oh. Get it out. No oh. way. The funny thing about the rest of the match, it looked a lot more like what you'd expect from a couple of all-time greats. Kalamazoo managed to squeak out a Game 2 win before Kirby Kaze struck back with a 3-stock on Final Destination to advance. Watching just those two games, you never would have known you had almost witnessed perfection from Kirby Kaze just minutes before. But the near JV5 is what anybody who watched that set remembers. That is how powerful the allure of the perfect game is. And it's also why this set produced one of the funniest YouTube comments you'll ever see. Between our own attempts to search through the archives and what was dug up on Twitter, this is the closest thing we've found to a JV5 in a tournament set between two top-level players. Kirby Kaze played as well as one could possibly imagine, and he still came up short. So will it ever happen? Probably not. But in the immortal words of the one and only Mango, there is so much more Melee left to be played, and that gives me a little bit of hope. Hey, thank you so much for watching, and thank you to my top tier patrons who make videos like these possible, including Abishua Stein, Bobby Wasabi, Eric is Cool, and NNG Esports. If you'd like to support projects like these, you can do so over at the link in the description.